Sir, you were one of 200 cadets who was Muslim at the National Defense Academy. And you said that the beautiful thing about the military is that you were never cognizant of your religion. Take us back to those years. Uh, once one of the fellows called me a katwa. One of your batchmates? One of my batchmates. Uh, uh, that means the circumscribed one. And the other fellows got after him. Mm. So this was the sort of friendship we all had. 16 officers, two Sikhs, two Muslims, one Christian, one Jew, commanding 600 men. Uh, and uh, nobody said anything. We were right, fought shoulder to shoulder. Nobody, nobody asked me my religion. Nobody asked me to go to Pakistan. Uh, none of that. Uh, it was a totally different atmosphere. Your meeting with Mohan Bhagwat grabbed a lot of headlines. But kabhi khul ke thik tarah se bahar nahi aaya ki hua kya us meeting mein. I want you to tell us first right. why you decided to do this. And he told us his misgivings. His misgivings were you all slaughter cows on the quiet. Okay. We said, uh, I reminded him that the eating of beef was prohibited in AMU in 1920 by Sir Sayyid himself because he said we have to look after the interests of the majority also. You know, we should not annoy them. Then he said, you call us kafirs. So we said, you are, you are people of the book. What is this concept of being a Sarkari Muslim? What does it mean? It is a derogatory term. So why are you using it for yourself? No. <laughs> I, if you read the foreword of the book, I have, yes. It says, I described what a Sarkari Musliman is. There are two types. One is a Sarkari Musliman who sells his soul for lucre. That's number one. The second variety is government servants who stick to the rules. were one of 200 cadets who was Muslim at the National Defense Academy. And you said that the beautiful thing about the military is that you were never cognizant of your religion. Take us back to those years. Well, really, uh, actually, our, after I finished school from St. Joseph's College Nainital, I applied for NDA. It was a very good schooling and got selected. And I landed up and uh, it didn't concern me that I was a lone uh, Muslim. Nobody bothered about it. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll tell you a very uh, uh, Once one of the fellows called me a katwa. One of your batchmates? One of my batchmates. Uh, uh, that means the circumscribed one. And the other fellows got after him. Mm. So this was the sort of friendship we all had. Uh, what to talk of discrimination, I always found affirmative action. People were trying to help out. Uh, not that I was a Muslim, but uh, they realized that I was working hard. And so I, and this continued right through my service, right through, never for an instance did I ever feel discriminated against. I always felt that I was one amongst all the equals. I think one of the stories uh, you sometimes share is how at the Battle of Longyearbyen, uh, the 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 soldiers who were fighting, you among them, they were a microcosm of our country yes. in in the diversity of backgrounds yes. that they came from. This was 1971. Yes. Tell us. Uh, see, uh, my regiment was initially a camel pack regiment. Uh, we got motorized just before the war. Uh, Sixteen officers, mm. uh, six hundred men. Out of the 16 officers, you'll be uh, interest, interested to know the composition. 16 officers, two Sikhs, two Muslims, one Christian, one Jew, commanding 600 men. Uh, and uh, nobody said anything. We were right, fought shoulder to shoulder. Nobody, nobody asked me my religion. Nobody asked me to go to Pakistan. Uh, none of that. Uh, it was a totally different atmosphere. Uh, at that time and I'm very very happy that I lived through 40 years without ever having felt. Recently on social media somebody told you General Saab go to Pakistan and you said what? 
well that already came in the tell us, tell us, tell us. Uh, you know uh, they said go to pakistan so i said i've already been there without a visa <laughs> and uh, after the 1971 war because after the battle of longa longewala we went into pakistani sindh and were there for four or five months so it was without visa entry and uh, nobody said a thing now i feel very very hurt yeah if somebody tells me to do that and i tell them why didn't you tell me earlier yeah when i was performing my duty for the country yeah absolutely the military ethos of multi faith celebration not tolerance celebration the sarv dharm sthals the mandir masjid gurdwara traditions the fact that the ceo the commanding officer of a regiment will take on in a way the faith of his uh, his men his troops ye bahar ke jo log hai na main bhi civilian hu but i have spent so much of my professional life covering the military logo ko samajh nahi aata if i want you to explain to our audience how is faith and religion handled in the forge uh if faith and religion see uh, religion is a very important facet of a soldier's life yeah. but it is your private business between you and your maker yeah. uh, i have served with uh, with a battalion which had half muslims half marathas uh, i was commanding the division in sekandarabad the bison dip and uh, they called me for eid i went there the commanding officer was present so was the brigade commander non muslims they stood up with the congregation yeah performed the namaz not that they were worshiping they were performing a duty yeah. and the same thing when i went to a mandir function mm. i was not there to pray i was performing a duty which i felt i owed to the men so everywhere you find if it's a if it's a non hindu he'll go to the temple sit there in fact i used to officiate over the aarti and other things nobody said a thing then why are you asking a uh, uh, i was just going to say i have seen hindu officers offering namaz i have seen muslim officers performing aarti it is between you and your maker and worship is your intent hmm. if you are there on a parade well you are there on a parade plain and simple worship you can do at home and such thing it is between you and your maker i am a firm believer in that tell us this you are one of the small group of muslim public intellectuals who decided we are going to engage as muslims with the rss your meeting with mohan bhagwat grabbed a lot of headlines par kabhi khul ke theek tarah se bahar nahi aaya ki hua kya us meeting mein i want you to tell us first right why you decided to do this well we decided to uh, open up the channels of communication we decided there is no point sitting quiet and sulking we have to open up and our detractors from the muslim community who criticized us yeah. saying that you are giving legitimacy to the rss by talking to them i said no you tell us the alternative they had no other alternative so i think the course we adopted was the best we do not expect that the rss will suddenly transform and become pro muslim no they won't but the aim was to talk to them understand their problems and convey to them our problems and i think uh, you know when we went there the meeting was given we found uh, bhagwat ji uh, in a very spartan office mm. uh, there was just plain furniture mm. he was bang on time to the second as a forgy you must have appreciated that. i really appreciate i yes. appreciate uh, a person mm. who who doesn't waste other people's time yes and he told us his misgivings his misgivings were you all slaughter cows on the quiet mm. okay we said uh, i reminded him that the eating of beef was prohibited in amu in 1920 by sir sayed himself because he said we have to look after the interests of the majority also mm. you know we should not annoy them then he said you call us kafirs so we said you are you are people of the book yeah. and uh, kafirs are people who don't have a book so these were the two problems uh, you know which he said uh, which were bothering annoying them. which mm-hmm. was bothering them we told us about the discrimination that was going on the calls for genocide openly done the hate speeches the hate speeches uh, which uh, i am afraid to say that uh, they have not 
received the the action which should be taken against people who ferment hate. That is our big problem which we face. So these matters were. How did he respond when you well, brought up Well, he said, "You all, uh, we, we will continue the dialogue." We assured him that uh, uh, we will make sure we will pass on a message. Firstly, we says that convict the people, catch them, but we are against vigilante action. I mean, vigilante action is never permissible in a society. If a person breaks the law, take action against him. But what is very, very glaring is the iniquity of justice. Mm. Uh, a person just has to utter a small word and he is convicted, punished for hate speech. A person who declares openly, uh, you, I mean, I don't want to mention it, no action is taken. So I call it inequity of uh, justice, which should not, which should be addressed immediately. How did uh, the RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat respond to your submission of hate speeches made against Muslims, of uh, targeted action, targeted violence? Did he acknowledge that there is some sort of problem? Well, he said that these, uh, he says they are uh, elements of this nature in both communities. These people are not under our control. This is what he said. But we told him that you've got a strong, uh, you the biggest social network in the country. And surely you can, uh, you know, uh, put pressure on these people. So we are waiting for him to take some action. Uh, we have uh, spoken out that we see very little change. But there's so been far. a second round of meetings. There have been two meetings. Unfortunately, I could not attend the second one. But you are part of the process. I am very much part of the process. I believe that the dialogue must continue. We may not achieve very much, but at least we can keep the temperatures down. And that is I am. Tell, tell our audience this, that, you know, when people from your own community started calling you traitors, you to right wing. Ho gaye. How did you feel? No, I didn't ruffle my feathers at all because I'm quite used to it. When uh, before the Babri Masjid, when the when the judgment was being declared, in I openly declared, "Let's give it." Yeah. And I said, "I've got reasons." I said, "Firstly, you're not going to win. Yeah. The the uh, the judgment will be against us." And I know because I've studied, I've been a, a judge myself in the Armed Tribunal. Mm. Uh, I've studied American law and others. And I find that judges rarely go against widespread public opinion. Mm. Secondly, I said, even if you win, will you be able to construct, reconstruct the mosque? Mm. They were quiet. But they did criticize me. So I'm quite used to criticism. It doesn't bother me. As long as I know that the path I've taken is the path of truth and justice, I'm not concerned. So in Ayodhya, you called for the Muslims to voluntarily, yes. uh, in a way... This was prior to the judgment. Before the, before the court ruled in favor of the mandir at, at, at the site where the Babri Masjid uh, once, once stood. Now there has been a call in some of your dialogues, this has come out in the public domain uh, with the RSS, that... Muslim groups should also give up rights over Kashi and Mathura. And that in turn, some of you have wondered, will it stop there? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I don't want to comment further on this. Uh, we've had a bad experience. We thought that after, after the Babri, the case would be over. But no, it'll keep... Uh, I know what's on the agenda. Uh, they will keep escalating because it, it's... Oh. It wins them, uh, you know. Well, let's see what happens in court. It is, it, it is uh, all so before, it, it is before the court now. Yes. And we do hope that the judgment will be fair and not under the pressure of public opinion. I want to pick up something that the RSS chief said to you in the meeting, that there are these kind of extreme elements in both of our communities. And do you feel, you know, uh, that there is a problem of leadership in the Muslim community in the sense that... India's Muslims have sometimes been let down by their own. You know, you have very, very sort of extreme representatives and the kind of public proclamations they make, for example, this call for sort of beheadings, you know, of, when, when the BJP spokeswoman Nupur Sharma was accused of insulting the Prophet and so on. Uh, we saw what happened in Udaipur, where actually violence was inflicted on a man for a Facebook post. Do you sometimes look at 
the history of modern India and feel India's Muslims have been let down by an absence of effective leadership or representation. Yes, there is certainly a lack of effective leadership. And uh, I've been saying so, yeah. that the Muslim need a think tank mm. to uh, examine every problem. Uh, the RSS has got a large number of think tanks. They think over 100 years. We think short term. Mm. And uh, I would say that uh, these uh, crazy elements in the community are minuscule. They are at the most, I'd say 10 or 12 of them who've been saying this but it's blown out of all proportion. Look at the hundreds of people attending the raglis calling for genocide and calling for, for you know, uh, for action against the Muslim community at large. Uh, there are hundreds of them. So don't compare the two. I would say that the, uh, the crazy elements in the Muslim community are bringing a bad name, but they are minuscule. Mm. What was your impression of Mohan Bhagwat after meeting him? I think he's an enlightened person, he's educated, uh, he's cultured and uh, you know the way you are treated when you go to, to his office, I thought it was, uh, I have a lot of respect for that person. I also attended the book launch uh, which Khwaja uh, Iftikhar, his book uh, in, uh, in last year mm. and there the, the issue came up. He says, um, you all are Hindus. Now, he pointed this out during our meeting. He that said, all Indians are Hindus. Acknowledge kariye. I said, Bhagwat sahab. And he said he means it as a geographical construct. Yes. yes. I said, Hindu describes a religion. If you say Hindustani, Muslim, we got no quarrels. And you yourself acknowledged it during the book launch. That if you got a problem with calling yourself Hindu, call yourself Hindustani Muslim. I said, I'm ready for Muslim Muslim. I mean, after all, when I was the defense attache in Saudi Arabia, the Arabs called me Hindi. Hind. Uh, Hindi Mulhaq from Hind. Askari Sifarat al-Hind. Or Hindi. Hmm. Uh, an Indian is always called Hindi. We've got no problems with that. And, but we've got a problem with Hindu. It, it, denotes a particular religion which we are not subscribing to. We are subscribing to Hindustan, the land of our birth. And he sort of agreed with that. He agreed during the book launch by saying, if you got a problem with calling yourself a Hindu, call yourself a Hindustani Muslim. We gladly accept that. You called yourself a Sarkari Muslim in your memoirs. And I want to take our audience a little bit back to how you look at your family, why you think the generations of your family have been Sarkari Muslims. Now, you're, of course, a, a, a big achiever, a big leader in your own community, but your brother is the illustrious actor Nasiruddin Shah. He went in a very different direction. You went into the military. What is this concept of being a Sarkari Muslim? What does it mean? It is a derogatory term. So why are you using it for yourself? No. <laughs> I. If you read the forward of the book. I have, yes. It says, I described what a Sarkari Muslim is. There are two types. One is a Sarkari Muslim who sells his soul for lucre. Hmm. Okay. That means I want to write a book. I want to sell it. Hmm. So what I do, I criticize what the other, other the, the majority wants. That is uh, Islamophobia. Hmm. Uh, I won't name the authors, but I've named them in the book. Hmm. So those are people who have sold their souls. That's number one. The second variety is government servants who stick to the rules. Mm. My father, when he was the first administrator of Darga Khwaj Sahib Ajmer, before that the government had no hand in the administration. My father was moved from Nainital to Ajmer. And once he tightened the strings, once he got the finances under the control, uh, people accused him of pushing a government agenda. No, he was only ensuring that the funds were not misused. They went in for the langar, they went in for education. Mm. So he was called a Sarkari Muslim. I heard that. Mm. This. And then the second time is when I was in Masuri and I, I had just got my commission and I met the AMU riding team mm. which came to Masuri, which came to Dehradun 
to participate in the IMA Hot Show. And then I met 10 or 12 of them. I said, this is the right or captive audience. And I gave them a talk on how horsemen would be very welcome to the army. We give a lot of importance to, to equitation training and everything. And I told them the, the honor and the glory and everything. Uh, and at the end, I asked them, how many of you would like to join the army? Not a single hand. This, I said, why? They said, Saab, you are a Sarkari Muslim. <laughs> that means you are pushing a government agenda. Mm. So that's the sort of thing I heard right through my life. And when I wrote my uh, biography, really, uh, the publisher uh, gave me two pieces of advice. One, he said that 90% of people who buy books don't read them. The title pay. They just use it as a decoration piece. So your title has to be very catchy. The cover of the book has to be very attractive. And I did that. I'm sure you'll yes, agree with yes. me. Uh, and he, when I suggested Sarkari Musalman, he asked me reasons why. Uh. So I gave it. Unfortunately, what has happened is my all my cosmates mistook that book to have religious content. I'm sure you'll vouch for it. You've read it. It has nothing of the sort. It just describes my life, how I've been treated fairly how I've been treated equally, how I've faced affirmative action. And uh, that is all about the book. Some people might use the phrase after your meeting with the RSS chief, Bhai, aap to sarkari Muslim. Uh, yeah, they hai did. Na? They, they did. did. Yes. What would you say to them? I said, tell us an alternative. What people don't know, and I want you to share that story, is that long before you actually met with the RSS chief, when you were vice chancellor of the Aligarh Muslim University, you reached out to the RSS even then, unofficially, through back channels, uh, and they helped you. Yes. And share that story. I was having a lot of problems with the HRD minister mm -hmm. and the local MP. They disliked me for, for reasons unknown, but they certainly disliked me. And... Uh, I told my army friends in Aligarh, mm. uh, get me through to the RSS. They brought four people. Mm. My wife looked after them. They went back. All that they told her is that we came to raise our grouses, but now we don't have any. <laughs> so after that, I found that the people who were gunning for me had mellowed to some extent. So that is, I and I pointed the house to my friends. I said, this is my experience with, with the RSS uh, uh, of Aligarh and let's do it now at a larger level. And that's why you went to uh, Mr. Bhagwat Ji. Did you always know that you would be a soldier? I always wanted to. Uh, see, I'm from a family which has been soldiering for hundreds of years. My grandfather fought the First World War. He was in 37 Lancers Baluch, mm -hmm. which uh, is now a Pakistani regiment. Uh, but uh, he was there. Yes. Uh, of course, they had abandoned their horses mm. and fought in the trenches. Yeah. My father didn't because he went off to, to Afghanistan and then on to England. But uh, he always encouraged me to follow the family line. And I did. And uh, since we were so used to uh, now, that time it was permitted shikar and angling and, uh, and a whole lot of other activities which, which the army gave me in full measure. I mean, I didn't have to pay. Uh, in fact, I was the uh, with the World Wildlife Federation. And when Mr. Salim Ali came to uh, to Ladakh to to find out the habitat mm. of the black neck crane, I was detailed as his liaison officer. So I took him to Puga Valley and I showed him there were 20, he told me there were 20 yeah. surviving black neck cranes. I'm glad the numbers have increased. So I was always fond of, of adventure. I wanted a good honorable life. Yes. Uh, it didn't pay us too well, but that didn't bother us. Uh, it was, we had enough to live honorably and enough fun right through service. Your brother took a very different path and I was seeing that you once tweeted that your father was very upset when he became an actor. In fact, he refused to talk to him, but you are a great uh, admirer. Are you and Nasir close? Very close. Uh, we are the best of friends. Uh, my father was... Uh, uh, of a conservative mold mm. and he felt that acting was a dishonorable profession. Mm. He frankly told him <laughs> and at my passing out, he says, look, uh, you know, he, Nasir was very impressed yeah. uh, and he's written it in his book. My father said, now you, you also try for the, <laughs> for, for the Indian Military Academy as I think, but he, he that 
uh, he had schemed that he would run away, which he did. He ran away. He ran away when he was 16 years old, had disappeared for eight months till we traced him back with the help of uh, Yusuf. How old were you then? I was 17. And he was? He was 16. So he's just a year younger. Yes, than you. yes. So your brother runs away to become an actor. He ran away to Bombay. And is untraceable. And was untraceable. For a few months. Then we wrote to Dilip. His Dilip sister Kumar. was living next door to uh, my parents in Ajmer, uh, Sakina Khanum. She wrote to her brother and uh, Nasir was uh, working for 10 rupees a day mm. on shifting flower pots on the sets. Mm. No acting career. He mm. was doing manual labor mm. on the sets. Mm. And he found the limousine stopping and a lady beckoning him. You are Nasir Nisha? He thought discovered. She said, get in. So he got in and uh, Dilip Kumar gave him a piece of his mind and escort, sent an escort with him back home. <laughs> So my father then realized that this fellow has made up his mind. So they had a pact. Uh -huh. This is all right. Uh, if you go to the National School of Drama, you can pursue. So he did. He qualified. But after that, no jobs, no work. Uh -huh. So he went to the, uh, to the Pune Film Institute. Did very well. Uh, was expelled one week before uh -huh. by Grish Karnad, who was the director for... Uh, for something Sorry, silly. Yeah. So he came back. My father wrote a letter of apology to Grish Karnad. He says, now take it back. So the director readmitted him. But he was so touched that he recommended him to Sham Benegal. And then there was and no And the rest is, history. the rest is history. As a young boy, when your brother runs away, what did you feel at that time? Well, I said, what a silly thing for him to do. <laughs> but he had told me quietly. Uh, I kept it to myself. Also, when he married... Uh, a lady who was almost double his age uh, in AMU. Mm. Uh, he had to told me his mind. I kept quiet about it. I told him, don't be silly. He says, you're old fashioned and such things. But we are the best of friends. Do you agree on things or you disagree fundamentally on a lot of things? Because as a soldier, you are conditioned to think in a certain way. Nasiruddin Shah is probably more left of center than you are, especially when it comes to issues of nationalism and national security. Right, right. Yes, he's got his entitled to his own views but all I would give him credit for is that he speaks his mind without fear or favor he he's he's and I think he's generally right uh, he's criticized uh, I get the pulse on uh, my cosmates commenting on various things I, I don't uh, indulge in that those sort of debates but I think he's generally correct mm. uh, whatever he projects he speaks his mind Let's talk a little bit about uh, why you thought that your stint as AMU Vice Chancellor was tougher than being a military man. Now, how do you explain this? You have seen war, you have seen riots, you have seen conflict, you have donned the uniform with honor, and you think being a Vice Chancellor of a university was the toughest thing in your life. Why? Yes, it is uh, tough because of the indiscipline of the students, indiscipline of the teachers, mm. both. Uh, I was told that uh, you are going there. Uh, I was in the Armed Forces Tribunal on the bench. Uh, Justice Mathur, who was the chief, he advised me, don't join. One of my friends became the Vice Chancellor of Jodhpur University. The students didn't let him live. I mean, uh, they tortured him so much that he gave up the job mm. prematurely. And he says, I sincerely advise you. Mm. But I told him, no. I, I'll resign. I think it's a calling. I really wanted to do something for an institution which had educated all my family, generations of my family. Uh, my Nasir went there. Mm. So uh, the first thing we did was clamp down on indiscipline. The president of the student union felt that uh, nobody could touch him. Mm. So I caught him on some financial discrepancy and I expelled him. He thought there would be a revolution, but there was not a whimper. Of course, he went running to, uh, to a leading politician. That time the Congress was in power. Mm. And I get a call saying that you've got to take him back. I said, I can't. No, no, he says, you jolly well take him back. Mm. So I said, look, you've got a choice between him or me. I'll resign. Let the new vice chancellor take him back. So the answer I got, hai, General Saab, jo aap kehte hai. So those are the sort of, and students then fell in line. The teachers felt that they could 
come shabbily dressed in chapels, uh, unshaven, uh, uh, non-punctual. I'm smiling because I'm thinking you were basically drill master with all of them. No, uh, one had to. Yeah. But I gave a lot of latitude to people. Yeah. I mean, uh, there were no restrictions on people meeting me. I made it a practice to go for namaz on, uh, in the main mosque hmm. every Friday. Hmm. That's when hundreds of students used to get around me and tell me their problems and such things. Hmm. The teachers uh, were less receptive to that sort of to that sort of idea. Uh, they said uh, Jal Sahib is imposing a military raj and such things. But I had no such intention. I kept my channels of communication open. Uh, it's not that all teachers are bad. There are only some rotten apples. The majority of the teachers in AMU are dedicated, carrying on their work. And I think they deserve a lot of praise for the hard, difficult work. You know, controlling 30,000 rebellious students is a tough job. Let me tell you. You faced a lot of flack for denying uh, girls access to okay. one of the main libraries. Right, right. Where when I also read it as a woman instinctively, right. I want to say, no, okay. sir, why? Kya tarika hai let me, let me yeah. explain. Did you make a mistake? I did. And I admitted it. Thank you. But yes. I'll tell you why. Yes. Why I said it was hmm. meant to be a joke. Ah, you made some joke which you... Which I shouldn't have. You shouldn't have. Yes. And Karan Thapa grilled me on it. Yes. And I got let's, away... Let, let's just, for context of our audience, you basically said if we allow girls into the library, there will be four times the number of boys. It was a it was a patriarchal comment and you shouldn't have made it. I shouldn't have made it. Yes. A white chancellor has to be more careful yes. in what he says. Hmm. But why did you not want them to have access? You know, yes. that in itself. Today yeah. we are talking about women in combat. They're flying fighter jets. They're, you know, the world is open for them. Right. Let me and explain. we can't get girls Let into a library. Explain. The women's college is four kilometers away from the university. Oh. These girls, when they used to travel, used to get waylaid. Their purses used to be snatched. snatched. <coughs> the girls had their own library. They could demand books online from the university library. And let me let me tell you, Miranda House girls are not allowed to the Delhi University Library. Really? Yes. Please find it out. Okay. Because they've got their own library. They can demand books. I didn't want these girls to be endangered in any way. So anyway, the ruling was given that no, no, you will admit, you will permit them. Mm. So uh, I said, okay, be laid on a bus. The first Saturday, 10 girls landed up to go to the library. The second Saturday, there were six. And the third, there were none. So my point was proved right. The girls just wanted an outing. They wanted to get out of the women's college and outing. I don't think the intention was to go to the library at all. But that's their choice. But that's their choice. But look, I assumed, and I really mean it, I had taken the place of their parents. Mm -hmm. When they were entrusted to me, I had to take care of the security. Mm -hmm. And one of the securities was making sure that they didn't get mugged on the way to the main university. But you know, sometimes overprotecting women is a disservice to them. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, and let me tell you, we are very, very proud of the girls in the women's college. And uh, uh, about 40% of the women of the students in AMU are girls. Mm -hmm. But 90% of the middle medal winners are the girls. They are doing exceedingly well. We are very proud of them. And I think that's the way forward. If you educate a mother, you educate a whole family. Absolutely. As, uh, as VC, as Vice Chancellor, you did meet with Prime Minister Modi. Uh, I think you had one meeting with him that I know about. Maybe you had more. I'm kind of interested in finding out how that meeting went. Because previously, you were also uh, the Army General tasked with uh, quelling the riots in Gujarat in 2002. And you had been critical of the administration, which was captured in your book as well. Now, of course, this is a sensitive point with the prime minister. He has often felt even sections of the media were unfair to him. When you met with him as vice chancellor, was he hostile? Was he fraught? How was he with you? No, no. He was very friendly, very understanding. In fact, I had a meeting before that also in a book launch by Professor Rajput. Where he just Who was the NCRT head at that yes, time, J.S. Rajput. Uh, it yes. was in the Islamic Center where he recognized me. He was passing through. I said, Jai Hind. So he caught hold of my shoulder and said, Shah Sahib, where are you from 10-12 years? So I said, 
आर्मी में सेवा कर रहा था अब एजुकेशन की सेवा कर रहा हूँ और मैं आपको बतलाना चाहता हूँ कि अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी नंबर एक यूनिवर्सिटी है कंट्री में तो कहा हाँ मुझे मालूम है सो ही रिकगनाइज मी ही ही हैज़ अ वेरी गुड मेमोरी आई थिंक ही इज़ गॉट ऑल द क्वालिटीज ऑफ लीडरशिप ही इज गॉट ही इज़ अ ग्रेट ऑरेटर एंड ही रिमेंबर्स थिंग्स द अदर थिंग्स ऑफकोर्स आई डोंट हैव टू मैंशन वॉट आई फील अगेंस्ट इज his absolute silence uh, when these hate speeches are delivered i expect my prime minister who is a strong personality to speak out whenever there's injustice against any community that is the only thing that has disappointed me so far and i do hope that he will find some occasion to speak out against would this. you call yourself a conditional admirer of prime minister modi oh uh, well uh, i admire him for or a critic I am neither. I am neutral. I don't have. A, uh, I have a high opinion of his uh, gift at oratory and his uh, memory. The Rand Corporation conducted a survey of all the generals, from uh, George Washington to General Eisenhower. That's two hundred years, mm. and listed all their qualities. Uh, they had differing qualities, but two qualities were amongst all. oratory and great memories uh, the prime minister i expect him that is a strong leader he has to be strong on behalf of all communities and all religions and i think whenever there's hate speech we expect the prime minister to speak out when you met him uh, the second time in a formal capacity how how was your conversation then well uh, i told him the problems of finance of the university the 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 university was i told him look uh, we are double the size of jamia we are the same size as bhu but we only get ha- get half the funds which bhu is getting so he listened to me intently uh, i also had some problems with uh, concerning the hrd minister i do smriti rani i don't yes at that time at that time i don't want to recount but i did mention that i had been unfairly treated he heard me with a lot of uh, patience in fact he and i were sitting together alone mm. uh, at the end of the meeting where i had taken my wife and other and my pro vice chancellor brigadier ahmed ali uh, at the end of the meeting i said prime minister i want 5 minutes with you separately so he told the nsa and everybody to leave two of us sat across the table and i told him the problems of amu i think he was very very receptive to what i told him and uh, and i admire him for giving me the time there's a big debate raging around textbooks and uh, textbooks yes and uh, you know in your capacity as having been a vice chancellor of a university we seem to be uh, this conversation has now been politicized for decades in the congress years it was accused of leaning left in the bjp years it's accused of leaning right how do we resolve the politics around our textbooks there should be no politics in history hmm. you know uh, i was on ndtv where i said this deletion of the mogal period is creating a gap in the history from so and so you jump to you jump of course to, they said we haven't deleted it we've no, no, edited no, it we've shortened it that's only it. a fig leaf hmm. that's only a fig leaf the, the the reason given is we don't want to repeat what they've learned in class 7 or 8 no no, no. you have uh, history is continuous and i also gave the example of the dark ages in europe hmm. where there was pestilence there was war the whole continent had been ravaged but do we avoid mentioning the dark period of course they don't mention it now but there was a period of 2 to 300 years it was part of history and if you don't learn from history you are bound to repeat the mistakes you made so i think there should be no gaps at all in history uh, say that the moguls or whatever they, you feel about them but don't delete any references to their to the uh, 400 years of rule what are the challenges you have said a lot about what you want the prime minister to do what you want the rss to do what are the challenges that plague the muslim community if you were addressing your own uh, community yes, yes. Uh, or everyone's your own community but along faith if you were to address fellow muslims what are the challenges what would you say to them the only challenge is education look i base it on my personal experience my father spent bulk of his pay in educating us in a in the top school of the country we were well educated 
Our foundation was so strong that my elder brother went to IIT, no coaching, nothing. I went to India, no coaching, nothing. Nasir ran away, but still made good. Yeah. So what we have to concentrate on is do what the Jews have done. The most reviled community in the face of the earth was the Jews before the Second World War. Mm. Six million had been obliterated because of this heat, of this hate. But what did they do? They went in for education. And let me tell you, Barkha, 99.6% of Jewish children are at least high school pass. I regret to say that in the Muslim community, for two reasons. One is poverty. And secondly, the ghettos in which Muslims live do not have quality schools. Mm. That is what I recognized when I was Vice Chancellor of AMU. And we decided to form the Sir Sayed Education Foundation. We have already opened four schools for the impoverished, underprivileged children. Uh, we, we advertised that we are going to, this is our mission. 40 families offered two acres of land free. We've been able to utilize two such offer, offers because it takes two crore to raise a good school. It, it has to be a, a, a Jobri type school. It has to be like the good public school with playgrounds and everything else. So my mission or the mission of the Sir Sayed Education Foundation is to form a chain of secular. I repeat again, secular. We don't want ghettoized education, but in Muslim concentration areas. So we, we opened these four schools. It has been a challenge to get non-Muslim students in, but we are gradually convincing people uh, to put in their wards. One of the uh, uh, non-Muslim uh, parents, the press asked them, don't you know that's a Sir Sayyid National School? This yes. Then why have you admitted your child here? Mm. Well, they said it's the best school in the district. What is holding India's Muslims back? Education. That's Education. the only reason? Education and, you know, the infighting among Muslim communities. Uh, you know, so-and-so is a Sayyid, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. You know, we also had a, a, a link with our prerogative, you know, was to write uh, our, commu our community name. Hmm. But we brothers dropped it purposely. What do you mean? Explain. Well, uh, you know, it was my father was Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shah. I would have been Sayyid so-and-so. But all three of us dropped it. Because you we, dropped the Sayyid. We dropped the Sayyid because we feel ancestry is something to live up to, not to boast about. So here you are boasting. So I feel that the, the, the Muslims of India are badly divided on communal and caste lines. We need to get it. I've been advocating that everywhere. What about orthodoxy, religious orthodoxy? Yes, that is a problem. If there's, you know, if uh, we don't have a priestly class, but there is uh, uh, some people, uh, the, the imams and other thing else, but they are not, they haven't seen the world. Hmm. They have, they've only been taught the Quran. They've been taught the translation of the Quran. They, they need to be like Christian priests. Hmm. I was taught by Christian brothers hmm. who were doctorate, who had doctorates in the various subjects. They knew their religion, but they were well educated. So we need the people who call the shots, they are the religious leaders to be also well educated to accept the equity of all religions. I mean, I say that the good Lord cannot be parochial and say that you are the chosen race. Yeah. Finally, um, General Saab, borrowing from the forge, the one message, uh, I know you've often used the clenched fist metaphor, and I think it's a beautiful one. So I might ask you to, 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 to share that with our audience. But the one lesson from the military that you think is so valid for today's India, what is that? Firstly, I'll explain the clenched fist. I said India is a country of five fingers. The Hindus, the Muslims, the Christians, the Sikhs and the Parsis. You injure the small finger. Can the fist be clenched? No, it cannot because your finger is hurting you. So don't hurt any community for God's sake. They are part of the clenched fist which we want to make India to be. We want India to be a powerhouse. Uh, the greatest lesson of uh, 
uh, which the army conveys is secularism. We don't bother about religion. We are religious, but that is our private business. And that's how I hope the country takes a turn to. So if I said to you, what does being Muslim mean to you? That would come lower down the hierarchies of what obviously being a soldier means to you. I think in some ways you're first a soldier and then anything else. Yes. See, being Muslim means uh, being true to your religion, being true to your salt. And being a soldier? I'm true to my religion. I try and practice yes. whatever yes. Uh, whatever I can. Uh, I don't say I'm over-religious. Uh, I've tried to, to be true to my salt. I mean, I've spent my whole life uh, fighting insurgency in the Northeast. And uh, nowhere did uh, I fear or nowhere did I balk from doing my duty. So I expect the Muslims to, and, and most of them are, there are a few, uh, you know, bad uh, elements. Yeah. But we should, we should not give them publicity. The more publicity you, you give, you are fanning the flames of more hatred. And what does being Indian mean to you? What is? Being Indian. I've asked you being Muslim, being a soldier, being Indian. Well, being Indian is being proud of your country, honoring it and working towards making it a superpower. Well, thank you, General Saab, for your service. I think you have spent 40 years and counting in illustrious service. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you, you Barga. And let me tell you that I admire your guts. You've been speaking for the truth. Carry on with the good work. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.